Being an Italian supercar, even an SUV, means that there's still a truckload of options to run through, although a lot of the interior in here is actually standard. It's only the eight and a half grand's worth of seat trim and embroidery, and I suppose the two grand worth of wheel that is actually gonna really change what you're looking at. And much of what you're looking at should be familiar to anyone who's been in an Audi A8. And that would include this new beautiful HVAC touchscreen, this terrific widescreen in here, a lot of the switch gear, including the lights and the uh, window switches. But you know what, who cares? Because it's beautiful. My first impression of being in the Lamborghini Urus SUV is just how smooth, and I suppose, perhaps how Audi Q8-ish it is, in that it's just a really suave, comfortable, refined SUV. It doesn't have that animal that the supercars have, but bringing it out on a curvy road like the one we're on now, amping this little lever up to Corsa, and using the drive split in this car that can run up to 87% to the back, just transforms the Urus into something that's amazingly fun and surprisingly chuckable, given that it weighs less than 2.2 tonnes, which is all Lamborghini's gonna say. Because it actually is quite a lot of fun. Like the G-force that you can manage in this thing and the balance in the corners, and best of all, the power out, out of a corner. I get on the gas early, just feel that bum shift a little bit, just hooks into the ground and just rips ahead. About the only thing that I can complain about is that sometimes you go to grab second thinking, yep, I got more, subconsciously thinking, I'm in a Lambo, and you've got about 300 revs left before it hits the rev limiter at 6.8, which is when the V10 is only just starting to really warm up and get a bit nasty. As part of drive safety feature, we're taking a look at tyres. Modern cars are very different to the cars of yesteryear, right from the way they drive to the built-in safety features and technology that help prevent and protect us in an emergency situation. What's not different is the important role a tyre plays. Without a good tyre on your car, safety features such as stability control and ABS simply cannot perform at a level that they are intended to. So, let's see how they perform in an emergency situation. Okay, so now we've got our super budget tyres on and we're about to tackle the 100 km an hour dry braking test. And let's see how it goes. Here we go, spot on 100 and... Bank. And, oh, dearie me. Is that further than the OE warm tyres? That did not feel positive at all. The car moving around and it just wanted to keep going. Yeah, that's not good. So I'm not too confident about this cornering test. Oh, jeez. Oh, Christ. I tell you what, I wasn't ready for that. That was clean off the track clean off the track. That was just total understeer and it did not want to grip up at all. Imagine that in an emergency situation. Imagine there's a child standing there or another car. Like that's just, yeah, you don't even really want to think about that sort of stuff. Our last set on the list is the Bridgestone. Heading out onto the track, the Camry feels good again, like it did in the beginning with its OE boots on. At the emergency corner, as I yank on the steering wheel, the car responds instantly. The stability control activates and helps guide the car around the exercise with the least amount of fuss. The performance focus Bridgestone stopped 4.5 metres better than the Camry's factory fitted tyre, whereas the worn tyre took an extra 6.5 metres to stop and the budget tyre added an extra metre. That's an alarming 12 metres difference between a quality performance tyre and the budget focus tyre. Steve McQueen was a legend of the silver screen, a true Hollywood icon. But we're not making Hollywood. I'm here to review this, the 2019 Ford Mustang 
bullet. Mechanically, there isn't a lot different between the bullet and the standard Mustang GT. There's a little bit more power, an extra six kilowatts that bumps it up to 345, but torque remains the same at 556 Newton meters. But to be totally honest, it doesn't really matter. The, the bullet isn't about the performance. The kilowatts and Newton meters and zero to 100 times isn't really what this car's about. After all, you're not Detective Bullet, you're not chasing bad guys around the streets, so you don't really need any more performance. What the bullet is about is the feeling that it creates. It's an emotional connection that you have with this car. If you love the movie, if you remember seeing it as a kid and watching that epic car chase, then you kind of get a bit of a taste of it with this car. The sound of it, as soon as you turn the exhaust over, you press the start button, the five liter V8 just roars into life. It sounds awesome. And that combination of that great V8 growl, the feeling of this, you know, the slick cue ball gear shift. It's got a rev matching, so whenever you change down, you know, the engine barks a little bit more. That is what makes the bullet so cool and so enjoyable to drive. Somewhat unexpectedly, it's the CRV that achieves the shortest dry braking distance from 100 kilometers an hour, outstopping the Tiguan by half a meter to record an excellent two run average of 38.29 meters. The Tiguan, Sportage, Tucson and CX-5 all creep under the 40 meter mark, just ahead of the Escape and Forester. The Equinox also stops in 40 metres, but its second attempt is almost 43 metres, dragging down its average and giving it the dubious honour of the biggest margin between stops. In the wet, however, two things become abundantly clear. That the ageing RAV4's abysmal 52.11 metres shows that simply having anti-lock brakes does not make every SUV equal, and that the Tiguan's outstanding 43 metre stopping performance awards it a massive passive safety bonus. The Tiguan also takes half a second less than the RAV4 to stop in the wet, and that's a margin you can feel from the driver's seat. Interestingly, neither the CRV or the CX-5 can maintain their dry braking talent in the wet, the Mazda in particular falling well down the rankings. The Peugeot Expert as the best medium van, the Mitsubishi Triton GLX as the best single cab work ute, the Volkswagen Amarok Core V6 as the best dual cab work ute, and the Ford Ranger Raptor as the best recreational ute. But the hardest worker of this bunch and 2019's commercial vehicle of the year is the all new Peugeot Expert. The Expert is exactly what it says, an expert when it comes to being a hard working van. And its victory here wasn't an easy one as it ousted the updated Ford Transit Custom that took out last year's overall award. Well, if this is gonna be your office for eight hours a day or more, then it's not a bad place to sit here in the front of the Peugeot Expert. There's plenty of space, good headroom, good vision, and there's nice, comfortable seats. There's also really good adjustment in the driving position with both reach and height adjustment in the steering wheel, which is pretty rare for a car of this class. There's also detailed graphics in front of me, including a digital speedo in the instrument cluster and all the latest functionality in the central infotainment display here, including Apple CarPlay. But it's also a really smart office on wheels too, with some really neat touches to keep you on the move. There's an elasticized clipboard holder here in the center console. Underneath the middle seat, there's also a clever little function. It's got an insulated box that acts like an Esky to keep your drinks cool for the whole day on the road. But where the Peugeot Expert really excels is how it makes your work life easier and your business run smoother with what it can do in the back. In this configuration, the Peugeot Expert has dual side opening doors into this pretty generous cargo carrying area. It also comes with a standard steel bulkhead separating the driver and its occupants from whatever you're carrying back here. At the back, there's double opening barn doors which open to two positions, straight 90 degrees or a full 180 degree width giving you great access for a forklift to load into the back here. And there are six sturdy tie down points in the back there to keep that load safely secure. One of the clever solutions in the Peugeot Expert is if you're carrying an awkward load, you simply remove this piece behind the passenger seat and you have extra length. But if your load's even longer than that, don't worry. Peugeot has an even more clever solution in the fact that you can lift up the front seat, push it through all the way into the footwell with a tie down point to keep it nice and secure.
The new Gen 330i essentially carries over its drivetrain from the previous model, though with calibration improvements. Its 2.0-litre turbo petrol four-cylinder engine produces 190 kilowatts across an impressively broad range, 5,000 to 6,500 RPM, and a chubby 400 newton meters of torque from 1550 to 4,400 RPM. BMW claims it's strong enough to thrust the rear drive 330i from 0 to 100 in 5.8 seconds, the equal best time here. The 330i also managed to outthrift its rivals, averaging 8.9 litres per 100 kilometres on test. From the moment that you turn the wheel in the new G23 series, you know that something has changed. And it's all about the immediacy of the response and the feedback that you're getting, both of which were lacking in its predecessor. Now that car's balance was still really good, but this car's is even better again. You can feel the back pointing the front end from the moment you turn into a corner, and yet the uh, opposite of that is that the ride is still really livable too. Like we're on nearly nine grand's worth of M Performance 20 inch wheels here with run flat tires, and the ride in this car is completely livable. No, it's not plush, but for what this sort of car is and how sporty it is and how great its handling is, it's really terrific and quiet. The other thing that's terrific about this car is its drivetrain. It's carried over from its predecessor, the uh, transmission as well, the eight-speed automatic, but both of them have been improved. The transmission's calibration is faultless. The engine is raspy and sweet and lovely and just makes the most glorious sound both in the cabin and from the twin rear pipes. This is the Caddy Beach, Volkswagen's answer to the new age combi. It's based off the Caddy Maxi trend line, which is usually a seven seater, but instead this beach was sent to Volkswagen's accessory lab to create the perfect mini camper. It's not the ultimate camper. It doesn't have a toilet, sink, stove or fridge, but it could be the perfect solution for anyone looking for a weekend getaway vehicle that doubles as a practical daily driver. There's also plenty of storage. These bags can be removable and they double as sun blockers. And there's curtains for the rest of the windows, which are placed under the bed, along with the bags for the other items like the tent, table and chairs. But this is where the real party begins. This fold away tent can be constructed in about five minutes. And you also get some tables and chairs to relax by the beach. Bring me my whiskey. Every year the drive team assembles its field in one place at one time for the Drive Car of the Year Awards. And it's the culmination of testing, 12 months worth of testing in fact, that brings all these vehicles together. This year we've got 100 contenders here at Wakefield Park, but there can be only one winner. And the overall winner for Drive Car of the Year is the Toyota RAV4 Hybrid. Six of the 11 models in the new fifth generation RAV4 range are hybrid variants and the company has phased out diesel power. Toyota Australia also tells us that they expect 60% of sales of RAV4 to be the hybrid model. The cheapest ticket into a RAV4 hybrid is the front drive GX model at 35,140 plus on-road costs or approximately $38,000 drive away. The all-wheel drive RAV4 GX Hybrid starts from 38,140 plus on roads or approximately $41,000 drive away. Under the bonnet lies a 2.5 litre four-cylinder naturally aspirated petrol engine, the same as you'll find in a Camry, producing 131 kilowatts and 221 newton metres. It's assisted by electric motors operating independently across the front and rear axles. Toyota gives an 88 kilowatt output figure for the front motor and a 40 kilowatt output figure for the rear motor, but the combined maximum lists as 163 kilowatts. Well, I think the Toyota RAV4 Hybrid is a deserving winner of the overall award because it brings the most benefits to the most people. Mid-sized SUVs are a growth segment and the RAV4 brings fantastic real-world fuel economy that none of its rivals can get anywhere near, fantastically low running costs, a brilliant interior, dad-friendly chunky looks. Honestly, there's almost nothing not to like, so Serious hat tip to Toyota. A Toyota RAV4 Hybrid is so groundbreaking. As we know, people love SUVs and this is really gonna help with the fuel economy and keeping costs down for family. It was a no-brainer. The best thing about the RAV4 Hybrid is that you don't really notice that it is a hybrid until, I guess, when you fill up. Congratulations to Toyota on the RAV4 Hybrid, an exceptional all-round vehicle. And don't forget, 
We've got videos and written reports on all the different segments and all the different segment award winners. So go back to drive.com.au for all the details. Welcome to Drive Car of the Year, powered by BP. 